Chapter 8 A Game of Chance Ever since I could read, I've always loved books. Educational, fictional, even technical manuals. If it had information or a story to tell, I wanted to read it. While I love reading books with practical knowledge, I had a soft spot for fictions. And one series stood out to me the most. The Savage Chronicles, featuring international rabbit of mystery, Jack Savage. I read all three of his books multiple times. Savage Seas was definitely my favorite. Action, adventure, drama, and even romance. Everything a good story needs. At times, I pretended that I was Jack Savage, sneaking through the burrow as if I was on a mission to steal some secret plans or find a kidnapped ally. My mother always told me to be careful not to bother anyone with my playing. I often pretended she was Jack's boss, the strict mouse that led his entire organization, the one who kept reprimanding him for going too far with his work, but always forgiving him in the end because the job was completed. Today, I really felt like Jack Savage. Onion and I chose the least conspicuous route and tried to keep a low profile. Sure, we could run into someone friendly, but from the experiences so far, it's better to be safe than dead. Thankfully, we didn't encounter much during the first half of our trip. I saw a few more cockroaches and some large flying things, but they pretty much left us alone. Maybe it was me looking all badass sneaking around in my battered trench coat, like i just come from a war zone. That... Or the fact that every time one of them got too close, Onion brought out his stun baton. Nothing like an oversized bug zapper to deter oversized bugs. The route we took followed the ruined highway 21, and with all the abandoned cars, steel, and concrete from wrecked roadways, we had plenty of places to hide in case of an emergency. We passed houses of all shapes and sizes, most of which didn't look very hospitable anymore. The land was fairly flat, so we were able to see for a great distance but not once did we see any other signs of life other than insects, which was probably a good thing. Since nothing was happening and we still had almost two hours to get to Beaverton, I was getting a bit antsy. I needed to do something to get me better focused. But what? As I climbed over a car that had formed some kind of makeshift barricade, I heard a clink on the ground. I looked down at my feet and there was the gun I had gotten earlier. That gave me an idea. I rummaged through my bag and got out an unopened bottle of Rad Cola. Using my multi-tool, I popped off the cap and it went clinking down to the ground. Not wanting to waste a perfectly fine beverage, and the fact that I was down to one bottle of water now, I put it against my lips and took a sip. It was warm. Very warm. It also tasted stale. It kinda tasted like recycled food chips before any actual flavor had been added to it. It, however, had the smallest bite to it. It was almost like drinking a nearly tasteless acid. Either it was better fresh or mammals' taste buds died with the rest of the world. I downed the entire bottle, not wanting to waste whatever water was in the slurry. I held up the bottle to the sun. It actually almost acted like a prism, creating small rainbows across my chest. Pretty. Um, miss... My sensors show that you have just taken in a small amount of radiation poisoning. Excuse me? That drink of yours, it's irradiated. A radioactive soda? What the fuck, world? Tell me you're kidding, Onion. You're not kidding, are you? I'm afraid not, miss. I can, however, inform you that it was a very minor dose of radiation. There should be no negative consequences, although I would advise you against drinking anything you find laying around for the time being. Great. Just great. Since Onion didn't seem too worried about it at the moment, it must not be a big deal. Although next time I eat or drink anything, I think I'll use my radiation detector on it first, just to be sure. Then I remembered something and started to laugh. I think it caught Onion off guard. Oh dear. I guess that radiation was worse than I thought. You seem to have bouts of uncontrollable laughter. <laughs> I'm fine, Onion. I just remembered something. You know that cat that started this whole thing? One of the questions actually feels applicable. 
It said that if I was suddenly exposed to a large dose of radiation and am now growing an extra limb, what should I do? And here I thought it was a stupid test. All tests have a meaning, miss, even if you can't see it. Yeah, well, if I start to grow an extra limb, please do not choose the first answer. And what would that be? A bullet to the head. Rather grim, if I do say so, miss. Rather grim indeed. So far, this entire adventure has been a lot like that test. Confusing, misleading, and bound to put me somewhere I don't belong. However, unlike the test, I have greater control over my outcomes. Now, to get back to the reason I drank the radioactive soda. I took the bottle and placed it on top of a nearby car. I stood with the sun behind me and took aim with the gun. Unlike last time I used a gun, I had ample time to see what I was doing. The targeting of it was rather simple. On the back half of the gun were two small posts and another large one near the end of the barrel. I knew enough of a gun from my reading that I needed to line up the single post between the two rear ones. I did this and took aim at the bottle. Click. Shouldn't something have happened? I pulled the trigger again. Click. What is... what am I doing wrong? Last time I pulled the trigger... A bullet went burrowing into the ghoul in front of me. I looked over the gun. Why was it not working? I wish I knew more about these things. I put down the gun and activated my pip Wars item database. Luckily, there was something in here that gave me a brief rundown on how guns work. I probably shouldn't have access to this. Hell, I didn't even know the burrow had guns until I escaped. I bet I had my mother to thank for this. I read through it for a bit. Ah, I bet this is the issue. I followed the instructions and ejected the magazine. Just as I had thought. It wasn't even loaded. Good thing I wasn't in a fight. I'd be screwed. I removed the box of bullets from my bag and loaded eight into the magazine. That wasn't a whole lot, but then again I really hope I don't have to use it. Once the magazine was in and the gun was cocked, I took aim at the bottle again. Unlike the last gun, when I pulled the trigger it was almost silent. I heard a small noise like air quickly rushing out of a tube. It also had very little recoil. I like this thing a lot better. Unfortunately, I completely missed the bottle. I shot again. Another miss. It was only ten feet in front of me. I pulled the trigger once more and this time I made contact. But I must have barely nicked it because it didn't shatter until it hit the ground. I really hope I don't need to use this thing anytime soon. Unless it's the size of a house, then maybe I could hit it. I reloaded the magazine and put it back in its home between my belt and body. I'll try again when I find some more bottles. Um, miss, I think we have company. What? Fuck, did they see us? Onion, keep out of sight. I tried to hide as well, but I think it was too late. Oi! Yeah! The voice came from behind me. I chanced to peek up and over the car I was behind. There were two wagons. Unlike the one before, these were actually crafted out of scraps into something out of the frontier times. Both of the wagons had similar tent-like coverings, preventing me from seeing their goods. They must have been connected because when one stopped, the other did as well. In front was the largest mammal I had ever seen, apart from the rhino ghoul. It was a bison. He was huge. And it's not just that he was taller than me. His muscles bulged beneath his shirt. I think he could bend steel just by breathing on it. From one side of the wagon walked two wolves. They contrasted each other, one with white fur, the other with black. They both wore simple vests and slacks. Hey, hey rabbit! I know you're there. No point in hiding. Maybe these guys are nice? Oh, me? Sorry. <laughs> I get startled is all. I got attacked by some ghouls yesterday and I'm just trying to be cautious. I tried to compose myself, but I don't think it worked. I put my hand on my gun as I whispered towards Onion. I'm going to meet them. Stay hidden and prepare for anything. 
I stood up, fully and slowly walking towards them, attempting not to seem threatening. It must have been working because the now visible guns the wolves had were still in their holsters. The bison stared at me as I walked, but he didn't say anything. He didn't have to. His muscles were obviously doing the talking. They said, don't try anything or I'll break you in half. I gave him as much room as possible. Okay, stop right there. Don't make any sudden moves. What are you doing out here, rabbit? What should I say? I escaped from a burrow and I'm now trying to find my way in this world. Heck, they'd probably laugh, shoot me, and be on their merry way. I wanted to punch myself. Stop thinking the worst, Olivia. I, am uh, well... I had to focus. I needed to plan my words carefully. I'm on my way to Beaverton. My brother's expecting me in a few hours. Unfortunately, I was attacked by a couple of ghouls about an hour back that way. They slowed me down a bit. Ghouls, you say? You look pretty healthy for ghoul bite. You alone? Funny story. I had a radio with me, and one of them emergency wind-up ones, and I was able to distract them while I ran. As for being alone, I actually have a friend with me. He went to look for some food while I rested. He should be back any time, so I'll be fine. You can be on your way. The wolves looked at each other for a moment. The bison still had not moved or said anything. The wolves reached for their holsters. I went to move my paw towards my gun, knowing that I was probably dead. My paw froze when I saw them unbuckle their holsters and place them on the ground near the wagons. We mean you no harm, Rabbit. We're just a couple friendly traders out peddling our ways, said the black wolf, giving a very large and slightly unnerving smile. That's right. My brother and I are traveling from town to town, collecting and buying anything that seems worthwhile. We sell it at a fair honest price. The white one seemed to say it more naturally, as if he actually meant it. I started to feel a bit more comfortable. I slowly opened my trench coat, took out my gun where they could see it, and also placed it on the ground. If they had openly disarmed themselves, it would be rude to not do the same. If they meant me harm, they'd probably still have their guns on their bodies instead of on the ground. See? We show peace, they show peace back, brother. Now then, we have a proposition for you, Miss Rabbit. The white wolf seemed to be the one in charge. He seemed to exude confidence. The name's Olivia. What's the proposition? Oh, you see, Olivia, Mum. We just happen to be heading towards Beaverton. It's still quite a journey, and do now on foot. Since you see you're waiting for your friend anyways, let's make a small wager. He continued to talk as he folded out a small table attachment to the side of the front wagon. My brother and I love a nice game of cards. Helps pass the time. And we often find any nice travels such yourselves to do in a game. We usually play for trade. If they win, we give them something for free. If we win, we simply charge them the full value of something they're planning on buying anyway. It's a win-win situation. He pulled out two chairs from the back of the wagon and placed them on either side. He pulled out a deck of cards and placed them on the table and waved me over. Tell you what, play a nice game of cards. If you win, we'll give you and your brother a free ride to Beaverton. And... If I lose, well then, you can offer up something of yours. Don't worry, you don't have to decide now. Let's just see how fate unfolds. Fate. There's that word again. In my experience, every time fate deals a hand, it's simply filled with nothing but misfortune. Of course, this could just be a simple card game, right? What's the worst that can happen? The most valuable thing I have on me is probably my gun and my supplies. Both can be reobtained once I get to Beaverton. And both were worth potentially cutting my trip in half. Okay, deal me in. What's the game? Perfect. The game is called King of Queens. Never heard of that one. Uh, that's because it's a house specialty. The rules are simple. He took out the cards as he spoke pulling the top four and laying them down face up in front of me. These are the four kings. Each one has a suit and color. The object of the game is to be the first one to pull matching king and queen of the same suit and color. That's it. 
I've seen hands won in two turns. I've seen them played out for an hour. He took the four kings and shuffled them into the deck. He cut it twice and handed me them, asking me to shuffle and cut once. I had never played card games before, but the rules sounded simple enough. It seems like it was less strategy and more pure luck. I handed the deck back to him and he dealt out two cards face down. One to him and one to me. Every time we draw one card. It draws out, but it makes every card pull suspenseful. You can't have fun without a little suspense. I took a look at my first card. It was a ten of diamonds. Dang. I was hoping for a good draw my first turn. I looked at him, but his friendly face was replaced with one void of expression. Looks like he's really getting into this. I tried to break the ice, maybe see if I could get him to show a hint of his hand. So, I didn't catch your name. I drew a card. Ace of Hearts. Well, that's because I didn't throw it. But since you obliged me with yours, my name is Jack. And this here, my brother Max. Jack? I was actually just thinking about a Jack earlier. A Jack Savage. You ever read any of his books? This time I got lucky. I drew a Queen of Diamonds. Now I needed a king to match. Yeah, I've seen a couple of them. Never read them myself. Tell you what, I got a copy of the fourth book. If you win, I'll throw it in free of charge. He drew another card, but his expression didn't change. A fourth book? I thought there were only three. There were more than three? If I had an expressionless face, it was gone now. A free ride and a book I haven't read? This would be the best day ever. I drew another card and got six of hearts. Damn. Come on, king. Yeah, from what I've seen, they made six of them, I think. Then the war happened and they closed down publishers to make room for military funding. I've seen others, but never a complete set. I've heard a full set is worth a bit of caps. Caps? No, don't tell me. Caps, you say? I just opened my mouth and said what was on my mind. Shit! If they realized I'm new to the outside, they could take advantage of me. But then again, he's been friendly thus far. Better not risk any more slips, just in case. Wait, you from a borough or something? Caps, you know, bottle caps, from sodas like Rad and Slot Spirilla. Well, you see, my family deals mostly in direct trade. Food for clothes, ammo for medicine, that type of stuff. You can put a price on something, but if you don't have money, it's worthless. Ah, you got that right there, kid. I've run into many who didn't have a single cap to their name, but we still managed to make a deal. Do I know your family? I've been all over. Eight of diamonds. Damn it. At least he seems to have the same luck as me. Mm, probably not. You know us rabbits. We like to multiply, so it can be kind of hard to keep track of. Especially when someone leaves a family to find some fame elsewhere. Eh, I know what you mean. We had a sister once. She left the family to go exploring for some abandoned factory. She heard rumors of tons of pre-war weapons there. Wanted to start her own gang. Stupid girl. She didn't even make it there before becoming a snack for a pack of savage ghouls. I'm... I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. It was her own damn fault she lost her life. And just like you lost this game. Read him and weep. He slapped down a king of spades and a queen of spades. Well, damn it. So what possession do I have to give up? I was so preoccupied with listening to him that I never saw his brother sneaking up behind me. Suddenly I felt his arms grab me and yank me from the chair. He was tall enough to where he was able to lift me a few feet off the ground with relative ease. He bent in, his muzzle touching my cheek and the stench of his breath invading my nose. Your life. Max said the words slowly, as if he was enjoying each one. Let me go! I thought you were just simple traitors! We are, Rabbit. We trade in all sorts of things. Food, supplies, slaves. And you, my dear Olivia. You are our newest piece of inventory. 
You better let me go this instant. Once my friend gets back. Oh, I don't think I'll buy your story. You're alone. And in fact, I do believe you're not from around these parts. How did life in the burrow treat you? Not good since you're up here, I'm guessing. How did he know? Did some burrows actually open on their own? I knew we weren't the only one, but no one knew how many there were or even where they were. I couldn't give up. I had to think of something. Jack pulled back the sleeve on my arm where my pit bull was attached. Eh, just as I thought. Only Burrow residents have a pit bull. Especially one in such good condition. This will fetch at least a few thousand caps. On top of what I can get for you. What do you think a purebred Burrow dweller goes for? Ten? Twenty thousand caps? <sighs> she smells sweet. I bet we can get at least thirty for her. From the look of it, she hasn't been around for much more than a couple days. Probably doesn't even have any radiation poisoning. Well, you got that wrong, asshole. I drank a nice big bottle of rad cola, so there! They both started to laugh, so much so that Max almost dropped me. <coughs> rad cola? You have to drink a hundred bottles just to make it worth a trip for the doctor. Stupid bunny. Fuck. What the hell can I do? I can't overpower two of them. They were about to take my pit bull, so signaling Onion would be out of the question. And even if they didn't take it, it's not like they would let me take the time to call them. My gun was at least 40 feet from me, and they were within reach of theirs. So even if I could make a run for it, they'd just gun me down in a heartbeat. On top of that, I could still see the bison standing there, emotionless. He must be a bodyguard or something. Onion, I wish you were here. I suddenly was dropped to the ground. I smelled burning fur as I turned around to see Max convulsing on the ground. Right behind him was Onion, stun baton extended. I just wanted to kiss him, but now was not the time. I turned towards Jack and saw him running towards his gun. I had an idea. When I was younger, I was always told that rabbits were great jumpers. And because of this, I pretended I was a gymnast. Jumping over everything, doing flips off the wall, and anything I could do to make my mother proud. The wagon seemed sturdy enough, so I quickly jumped to my feet and put all my strength into my legs. I jumped in the air, rebounded off the wagon right on top of the wolf. I impacted him so hard he went flying a few feet away from his gun. I grabbed the gun just as I saw him extend his claws. He was pissed. Oh, why you fucking cunt? You pay for that. He was charging full speed towards me. I hesitated for a second. But only a second. When I heard Onion shout at me to watch out, my instincts kicked in. I pulled the trigger. Jack let out a loud howl as he fell to the ground, blood spewing from his leg. On that cue, Onion floated over to him and gave him a long enough jolt to knock him unconscious. My heart was still racing when I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned around to see the bison, no longer motionless, coming straight for me. I had forgotten about him. I pulled the trigger, but it only clicked. Fuck, one bullet? Even if I had the common sense to reload my gun after using it, Onion was still floating over Jack, and he was not fast enough to reach me in time. I braced myself as the bison grabbed me in his arms and held me up high. It would only take a few seconds, and I would be dead. I didn't even last three full days here. Or so I thought. I was alive? Was he crying? Thank you. Thank you, little bunny. That was unexpected. You can thank me by not crushing me. I'm starting to lose feeling in my legs. He put me down, wiped away his tears, and he stood, no, towered in front of me. I don't even think I could jump that high. I killed these two wolves, yet he was thanking me. What kind of twisted world is this? Oh, okay, okay. Tell me something. Who are you? Who are they? And why the fuck did they just try and take me like some piece of scrap laying on the side of the road? You really aren't from around here, are you? No, I'm not. 
Please enlighten me. They are slavers. They go around finding helpless mammals and tricking them into captivity before selling you at the nearest slave camp. That's how they got me, and that's how they get everyone. At least until you came around. But you're twice as big as them. You could probably kill them without breaking a sweat. It's true. I am very strong. I used to be a pit fighter before I met my wife. Once I found out she was pregnant, I put my life behind me and started a family. My family is why I was enslaved. Here, let me show you. He led me to the rear of the wagon. Onion floated nearby, but I assured him that this was all over, and to watch over the wolves in case they woke up. When we got there, he threw back the fabric panel, and standing in the dark interior were two figures. He assured them that it was okay, and they both slowly got out of the wagon. But despite being a different species than me and her clothing being more tattered than my trench coat, she was actually very pretty. Her dark brown fur was surprisingly clean, at least compared to his. She was wearing a simple dress, but I noticed a flashing light coming from a strange collar on her neck. Behind her was a small girl. Her fur was lighter than her parents, but she had the same cuteness of her mother. She must have been very afraid. She kept hiding behind her mom. I noticed the same color on her as well. Your family is lovely. I can't believe they're animals who would buy and sell others like property. It's a very unforgiving world we live in. I should have been able to protect them. But one day when I was out gathering wood for a fire, these filthy creatures broke in took my family hostage. When I got home, they said if I played cards and won, they'd be free. If I lost, I would take their place as slaves. Let me guess. You lost. I get that. They went back on their word. But like I said before, why didn't you simply overpower them? I doubt a small gun would have stopped you from protecting your family. He asked his wife to step forward and pointed at the collar around her neck. You see this? This is a special collar used by slavers. It contains a small explosive. If they push a button, or if someone tries to take off, it'll explode, severing their head and killing them instantly. Some are even rigged so that if their owners die, the collar will go off. They already had them on, so even if I tried anything, I'd be killing my own family. Bomb collars? This is fucked up. I'm guessing since they're all still alive, the wolves didn't get a chance to activate them. Thankfully, they didn't place one on me yet. I would have been really screwed. I walked over to Jack, who was still unconscious. I went through his pockets and found a small brick-shaped device with a single button on it. Must be the detonator. So, how do you get these things off? You can't. Only the slave camps have the ability to remove them. Prevents the slavers from double-crossing them and stealing the slaves for their own. Of course. Why wouldn't there be a simple solution? Time to make use of my brain. I told them that I was not going to leave until I figured out a way to free them from these collars. The bison looked a bit hesitant. You see that robot over there? Say hi, Onion. Uh, um... Hi. Well, I made him by myself. From scraps that I found lying around, I even programmed him myself. I did that when I was a kid, as well after my mother... Let's just say, I had no one to help me whatsoever. I think I can disarm a small bomb. Okay, but please, be careful. They're the only things I have left. Great. Put more pressure on me. Thanks. I took out my tools and found a screwdriver small enough to open the remote. It was simple enough in design. Push a button, activate the transmitter, boom. Unfortunately, it was too simple. There would be no way to override the collar lock with this. I set it down, away from where it wouldn't accidentally get activated. And I asked if I could take a look at one of the collars. 
He looked at his wife and gave her a smile. She sat down on the ground and I stood on one of the chairs to get a better look. This thing was a mess. I found the explosive easily enough, and the transmitter. But it looked like it had been thrown together in the dark. Some of the wires didn't even connect to anything. I did, however, see a large bundle of wires that went through the entire collar. That must be what senses if the collar is cut. Best to leave that alone. At this distance, if I set the thing off, it would probably take us both out. Since I couldn't physically do anything, I got down to retrieve the detonator again. I have an idea that should work. There's at least a 90% chance of it. And what if you're wrong? He asked with worry in his eyes. Then, I give up my own life. It's only fair. Miss Springs! Quiet, Onion. If I kill her, I'm no better than these fucks. And I would deserve anything that happened to me. That... You are not like anyone I know. Please, do what you can. I took out my Pitbore's physical connector and spliced in with what I hope was the main wire harness of the transmitter. I opened up my Hacktron application and started to punch in some commands. I successfully interfaced with the transmitter. It seemed it had two separate channels. One of them was connected directly to the receiver and connected to the explosive. I don't want to mess with that one. The other signal was buried deep within the first. It took me about 20 minutes, but I was finally able to isolate it. Once it was decrypted, I modified it, re-encrypted it, and I was ready. Okay, ma'am, would you please stand over there? And, sir, if you would take your daughter, I promise you with my own life that this will work. He hesitated again before calling his daughter over, and she started to cry, calling for her mom. I was starting to tear up. If I failed, she would grow up without her mother. And I know that pain all too well. No, don't get all emotional now. I know this will work. It has to. I closed my eyes and activated the program. I braced myself for an explosion that never came. Instead, I was greeted by a small clank on the ground. I opened my eyes and saw the collar had fallen off. She was free. And both of them started to cry. And since they were crying, it caused their daughter to cry even more. But I could tell that these were tears of happiness. I found the signal for the daughter's collar and successfully disarmed that one as well. I was starting to cry as he ran over and grabbed me again. I just stayed there, giving into his hug as I could feel his tears falling on my head. I'm starting to have trouble breathing. He put me down, just as a wife smaller than him but much taller than me, hugged me as well. Only this time she bent down and it felt more like a loving embrace, rather than a wrestling move. The daughter gave me a hug, even though I could tell she had no idea what was going on. She had to have been around four or maybe five years old. I smiled at them, wiping away my own tears and asked, So, what will you do now? Head very far away from this place. There's a town called Hope far north of here. It's the only place within a hundred miles that one can truly feel safe. If we sell these slavers goods, we should have enough money to sustain us for some time. Hope? I haven't heard of that. I was heading towards a place called Beaverton myself. Heard it was the nearest trading settlement. And I am searching for both work and supplies. I would stay clear of Beaverton if I was you. I've never been, but I've heard that they're not the friendliest bunch. Sure, they'll trade you anything for anything, but at what cost? How about you join us? We can travel to Hope together. That was a very good offer. Protection and company. Plus, I wouldn't have to worry about my feet getting sore from all the walking. But then I remembered the letter. I'm sorry. I appreciate your concern and your offer, but I have an urgent letter for someone in Beaverton. Two cheetahs were killed trying to deliver it in a rush. 
and to tell you the truth, I have no idea what it is. But I can at least deliver it for them. I'm sorry. Did you know them well? Actually, I didn't. They didn't even know me. I watched the wife as she was murdered. Too afraid to do anything. She was killed by animals that feigned kindness. Just like these two. And they were the first mammals that I had seen since leaving the burrow. So I didn't know any better. Her husband was killed by ghouls. I found the letter earlier today. And even though they didn't know me, I owe it to them. If I was stronger, I could have at least saved her life. That's part of the reason why I helped you. I already saw one death. I don't want to add any more to it. You really are something, Rabbit. If there were more like you, this world might actually stand a chance. If you ever find your way to Hope, look us up. I promise you a place to stay and food to eat. That's the least I can do to thank you. I'll take you up on that offer. If Beaverton is the place you say it is, once I'm done I'll make my way to Hope. The bison asked me to wait a moment and went to the first wagon. He rummaged around in there for a few moments and came out with a small bag. Here, take this. Food, medicine, there's plenty here for our trip. Thank you, Mr... You can call me Bo. That reminds me. What should we do with these two? Leave them. They'll get what's coming to them. Now, if you'll excuse me, we should get some rest before our travels. Goodbye, Olivia. Goodbye. I smiled and waved as he climbed into the back of the wagon with his family. As I was heading to get my gun, I stepped on one of the collars. Explosives came in handy before, and so I picked them up and put them in my bag. As long as the transmitter was disabled, they should be fine. I signaled to Onion that it was time to go. After we were a good distance away, Onion was the first to break the silence. You really shouldn't gamble with your life like that. What if you had failed? It was a risk I had to take. So far our encounters with bad mammals have greatly outnumbered the good. Someone has to be the hero. I just wish that someone wasn't you. The rest of our trip was met with little resistance. We ran across two of those large flying insects again, but this time they tried to attack me, spitting some sort of sticky acid at us. I didn't hesitate to pull out my gun and shoot them. My aim was getting better. It only took me three bullets to take them both down. I was getting better at this. And somehow, that scared me. The highway ended about 20 minutes ago. And with it so did the abandoned cars that we had been using for cover. Everything was open. And it was making me nervous. There were still buildings here and there, but nothing really worth investigating. Those supplies Bo gave me came in handy. Three more bottles of water, some canned asparagus, and some more of those carrot rations. I guess they weren't exclusive to the burrow. There were some basic medical supplies, gauze, antibiotics, and some more quickie fix. If Beaverton doesn't pan out, then we go to Hope. I'll have to find a way to repay him for the supplies. Speaking of Beaverton, according to my pit board, it should be right over the top of this ridge. From the topography on the physical map, it seems that the flatlands ended at the cliff and divided into Savannah Central, where we were, and Sahara Square. I pulled up a geology book on my pit bore and saw that we were actually walking in what was a river. Since there was no signs of water anywhere, I'm assuming it was long dried up. The river flowed over the cliff face and into the harbor that the water treatment plant was built on. As we got closer to the edge, I could start smelling something. It smelled like burning. I could see a bit of smoke rising. A fire in this weather? Then again, we were near a desert biome. So maybe they also like it hot. Also, if it was anything like the water purifier in the burrow, it used the heat from power generators to filter the water through evaporation. Maybe this is how they did it. It would make sense. I'm sure electricity is hard to come by out here, but fire? That can be made anywhere. We finally got to the edge of the cliff 
and I froze. I expected to see a large, bustling town, homes, and people everywhere. I thought I would see children running through the streets while their parents worked in businesses and traded their wares. I expected to see life, a civilization thriving in the middle of a wasteland. That's not what I saw. Ruins. The smoking ruins of a town. Nothing was left. Buildings were burned to the ground. Some of the fires were still burning, but it was mostly smoke. Then the smell hit me. Even from up here, I could smell burning flesh. It was horrible. Who could do something like this? Savagery and murder, that was one thing, but this! This was unadulterated evil. I don't care what some place did to deserve this. No town can be so bad that you have to burn it to the ground. Oh dear. That is... was... Beaverton. I closed my paws together and held them with every ounce of my strength. I will find out who did this. And they will pay. You don't even know who they were. What if the entire town was like those two wolves, or even worse? What if this was a slave camp? I don't care, Onion. If these were low lowlifes like them, they still deserve better. A trial, jail time, or something. There has to be some sort of justice out here. Even if it was a slave camp, wouldn't that mean there were slavers and slaves alike? Shooting someone is quick. Doing it right should be painless. But burning someone? No one deserves that. Sure, I don't know what it's like to die. Get hurt, yeah, but not die. I do know, however, the pain of getting burned. It was only a few years ago. I was working on Onion when one of his circuits caught fire. Stupid me decided I would just put it out with my paws. I burned not only my fur off, but a layer of my skin. And for the few moments I felt that burn, it was like no other pain I'd ever felt. Imagine going minutes or longer with that feeling, knowing that it will never end until you do. From the look of it, this place must have housed a population of at least a hundred, if not more. We need to check for survivors. Do you think that would be wise, miss? What if whoever did this is still here? I don't care. We need to offer help where we can. Even if it's simply to ease their pain. This world is chaos. Bo and his family have been the only ones to show there's still good left in it. I kept hope that there was more than just them. That the good can't be so easily defeated, no matter how much evil is in this world. Burrow 76 was safe. Safer than this. But it was misguided. Those who could help were put into positions where they couldn't. At least not to their full potential. Out here, you are free to choose your way. May it be good, evil, or balance the line between both. You can decide your own fate. I have narrowly escaped death three times now coming from it unscathed. I, for one, am starting to believe in fate now. And I believe that fate has chosen me for something greater than myself. This world needs good. This world needs a hero. Until it finds someone better, looks like I need to be that hero. Your move, fate.